I'm getting, I'm talking too much. Anyway, Tim, we're going to call Brother Tim to come on up right now and share with us. Amen. I love Tim. Tim is a member of the faith from the, from, from the beginning and even before that, years he's been in Pentecostal Temple. Just like I told Herschel last week, he ought to know something by now. <laughs> And this I know to be true because he has raised, he's raised uh, many young men in his community, testimony to Tim and Veronica's uh, uh, faithfulness, but continue to do what you do. Come on up, sir. I'm scared. I'm going to see you on the clock. I'm going to see you on the clock. I told the pastor a few minutes ago, I said, I said, you ready? And I'm like, yeah, because all I need to do is say, amen. <laughs> That's that testimony. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Oh. That was enough church right there. <laughs> and that same young man came, that same young man came to my house yesterday. Yeah. yeah. And I was in the bed sleeping. He woke me up and I looked at him and said, What are you doing in my room? Matter of fact, what are you doing in my house? I got something to tell you. He told me, and I was like, Well, you know what that means? I said, I know you got a job, so keep working because you got me. Another mouth to feed. I was uh, looking online in my office last week, you know, and some statistics came out about Mother's Day and Father's Day. It said Mother's Day was the busiest day on the telephones. But Father's Day was the most profitable. And I was like, hmm. so I kept on reading. We gave a few examples, maybe because of dads, we were had a tough love. Well, get on up. <laughs> you all right? Dust yourself off and keep on going. But they said almost it was most profitable because a lot of the phone calls were coming from institutions. So some kids did think of dad, well, I'll call them Colette and tell them happy Father's Day. But Mother's Day, you could barely get a phone call through. Father's Day, we no problem to get those collect calls through. They was going to make that money. You know, you're right. I've been around from Pentecostal Temple to your family faith for 16 years old. And I remember when I first came to church, I had to make a deal with my wife because I was not giving up Sunday sports. I sure that. Basketball, football, baseball season, because I don't watch baseball on TV. But I go to church every Sunday, which you did, but basketball and football, I gotta see the game. So she made a deal with me. She says, I tell you what, go to church every other Sunday. So I'm like, oh, I can do that. So the Sunday I didn't go to church, the rest of the show I went to the store the night before. I had it all in the refrigerator. She did church, and I'm sitting there drinking, watching the game. My kids go to church. I was at home by myself. I had to deal with this. On Sunday, I had to go to church. I was like, man, don't turn no TVs on, don't stop, don't go straight home, make a beeline to the house because I recorded everything so I can go back and watch it. <laughs> then I got hit to ESPN. I can watch the whole day. What I need to see in five, 30 minutes, in a 30 minute segment, I didn't, I didn't see all I need to see for the first day. So I said, well, you know what? I was sitting there one Sunday, and I was sitting there sitting on the bed with my kids and wife at church, and I was like, my babies were young. And I was like, wow. I thought I was being a role model father. I thought I was setting a good example for my kids. We get up every morning. I don't care if I was sick, hurt, bleeding. Get up and go to work. Never miss a day at work. Always on time, right today. Have to be on time. But we going somewhere, I'll be mad at my wife because she's taking too long to go. He can never say it perfect. That's why we got two kids. Go Kill the hard take my wife. Say it perfect. But I, my two boys back there, I was like, what am I actually leaving behind for them to follow? Because they're going to be young men before I know. I had no clue I was coming to the middle of the Mojave Desert to live. <laughs> and when we got here, and I had been here twice already, but I had never been here in the summer. And that first summer, I was like, oh no. <laughs> I can't go back. I can't stay here, but I can't go back to Chicago because I got two boys I need to raise up some kind of thing. 
So I would sit home and I would put it on. My kids, they don't see me drunk. They don't see me in the club. When I was at the club, I wasn't perfect. I could never figure out I mean, what, was, what I was missing something. I had an actual father who I really didn't know because he made too many promises that he couldn't keep. So I had nobody to bring me into the church and introduce me to God. She did. My wife. 27? 27 years this year. <laughs> my wife, who's been my girlfriend since she was 12 years old. She'll be. <laughs> but, you know, but through it all, you know, I thought, I couldn't figure it out. I was missing something in my life to raise them two boys up. And people would tell me right today, you know, your kids, when we see them out of town, they're very respectful. I know I can go to bed at night and not worry about it. If my kids aren't in the house, I don't have to worry about that they're doing something wrong. Because they think it's video games. So, until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, that's fine with me. <laughs> I know they ain't getting in no trouble. So, you know, through it all, so I kind of figured, I said, well, God's got me here for a reason. He's had his hand on my life for a long time. A long time coming. I didn't even know him. <laughs> From Chicago, the 24 years in the military. Marine Corps told me when I joined the military, I said, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. I got to get with the Marine Corps told me, you got to get out. We're not going to promote you. I was like, wow. How do I fix this? Because I don't want my kids to see their father as a quitter. Because I know what Jesus endured on this earth is nothing compared to what I have to endure. But I know if I endure to the end, I have a greater reward. And so, I said, okay, I need to live a life. I need my kids to see me. If I, 16 years from now, when they become young men, they're gonna say, well, I don't think I can really talk about my dad. So I'm gonna go to church. If you ask my dad for something, he was there for you. If you needed something, he gave it to you. Even if that was his last. I don't see my dad cry, I don't see him worry about anything. I have nothing to worry about. As long as, as long as my faith is in God, I have nothing on this earth to worry about. My yeah. wife has worked in three or four months time. I was looking at me. Spending money on playing tickets to go to a family in Chicago. I'm like, <laughs> who got the money for this time? Like, but I kind of sit back and I say, you know what? When one door closes, God opens up another. Yeah. And that door closes and he opens up another. He's been doing it in my life for years. And I was so blind I never saw it. But I knew I had a spiritual father that has set thousands of examples. The perfect role model. And I said, if I would be an example for anybody, and I have two of my natural boys, I have one adopted, one I got guardianship of, I got two nephews live here, and all them boys, I've had my hand in their life some kind of day. through God. Yeah. Because I look at my kids now, and, you know, train them up in the way they should go. Because they know they can always, if anything, Church door is always open. So, if I help plant that seed in my kid's mind and continue to water it as the years go, as the years went by, I know for a fact that they know who God is because nobody introduced me to Him. My wife did, and then I had to go from there. Because as a man, as a father, you know, I have to be the head of my house. That's right. That's right. I have to teach them about the Bible, about Jesus Christ, how he walked on this earth, what he suffered, how we must suffer. Because life ain't going to be easy for us. 
You know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine at work the other day, and I told him, I said, uh, yep, I work at the post office, and been there 16 years, I retired out of 24 years out of the military. And I said, you know what? I will give up my retirement checks to know him for a life of Jesus. Amen. I know for the fact that he will provide for me. Amen. He's going to give me everything I need, everything I want. Right. He's proven it to me over and over and over again. Don't get me wrong, I walked around for some years with the blinders on. Open them every, every now and then, but. You know, I kind of work in the behavioral health field as well. And work with a lot of young men from broken homes. And I understand now, there's no fathers around. They don't know who God is. Nobody in the house knows who God is. They don't know anything about God. So every weekend, I go pick these little guys up. I take them over to my house and we go swimming. You know, every chance I get that opportunity to water that seed, I'm going to water it. Uh, Warren, that young man told me last night when I was taking him home, Pastor, he said, uh, I really want to come to the church tomorrow, but I got to go to work. He said, I got to be working at 11. He said, What time are you going to be talking to the table? I said, <laughs> He said, Maybe I'll call it late. I said, No, you go to work because you got a child and you're raised. And I got to his house and he gave me a hug and he got out of my car and he walked away. And he came running back. He said, uh, I just want you to know, I really, really appreciate you in your life. I was only in your house for less than a month, but I took a wealth of knowledge away from your home when you got there. So he says, I appreciate you being there for me and being that type of role model that people can always look back at and say, you know what, that was a good man, that was a god fair man, and, and he would do anything in this world for you. Yeah. And I tell my two children, my boys, every chance I get to talk to them that, you know, it's not what you, you know, it's not about the material things out here. I said because one day we will all have to stand up and give account for our life. Yeah. Yeah. And it's what you're doing now. Yeah. And what you're storing up right now is what's going to last. Yeah. So, brothers, you know, all of that was last Sunday, but we must also be accountable for our children. Especially if we sit up in the church. If we're not teaching godly things to our children, the Bible says the scarcely the righteous works. The scarcely make it into heaven. The Lord doesn't want us to teach our children our perfection. Even in Jesus, the Lord wants us to teach our children his perfection. That leaves room, fathers. That when we fall down, we stumble, when we mess up, even in front of our children, eyes are shut up. <laughs> it's still okay. Because it's not about my perfection. You be honestly, most young men don't realize how blessed they have it until they grow up and leave their father's home to realize, you know what the fact is? He was there. He was always there. And he loved me, and I thank God for that. He's Tim Hammer, like a running joke, because we were Rob Red and Matthew two or three or four times. And he always quote me scriptures in Matthew. He's waving y'all Matthew now. He always quote me scriptures in Matthew, and I would kind of quietly just, ah, that brother knows Matthew. Exactly. And he never quotes John. He never quotes Acts. He never quotes Romans. And, and, and I said, Robert, what's up? He goes, well, guys, I keep starting over, and I keep, you know, I stop for a while, I still, and I keep, can't get past Matthew, but I know Matthew. <laughs> Matt, there's enough in Matthew to bless you so you better believe it. Be brave, y'all, Matthew, now. I thank God for it. You know, me and Matthew, we're going to save the world. We're going to save the world and me. Oh, man. Oh, man. You know, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm just having memories of it. It's, it's, it's a blessing to have a relationship with your pastor to where. You know, I, 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 I look at him as my spiritual father, but at the same time, we have a, a good friendship. Amen. And I, mean, I, I have not been to too many churches and have been uh, in too many ministries where I've experienced that. So I, I thank you for that because, it, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be that way. 
you know, and, and as you can see, we have a good time together. <laughs> but yes, I do have other scriptures in the family. Nothing wrong with that. That's funny because it is true. And oh my goodness, I feel like such a turkey at times. See, I've never been a turkey. Every time he says turkey, I laugh. So I think of like some of the old, you know, uh, uh, 70s black exploitation movies that are like, job time turkey. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I hear. So, um, but anyway, I digress. Um, um, the topic that I was supposed to speak on dealt with affirmation. And, you know, it was this. First, I had to, I had to ask Pastor Light in what context did he mean affirmation? And it was more like, you know, I guess positive affirmation. And I had to think about that. I was like, hmm, okay. So I went back to, you know, to my childhood growing up. My dad is, uh, my dad and Deacon about the same age. So, and my dad's from the South, so they a Deacon. And uh, um, so he came from a, you know, a different school. You know, my dad's from Texas. So, grew up on a farm, you know, was in the military, and he was, you know. So, as far as um, growing up with a lot of positive affirmation, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't my dad. And I'm not saying here, maybe like I had a whole with that, I said it. But I think men of that school and that generation, you know, for the most part, you know, raising your son was about, you know, training, discipline. You know, making him the, the, the strong man that he needs to be. <clears throat> and there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, um, many of those uh, training slash whippings uh, kept me out of a lot of trouble that I could have gotten into growing up in the streets of South Central LA. So, uh, um, but, you know, this generation of fathers, it's, uh, it's a little different, you know, because we're uh, not all of us, but, you know, we're. We're, um, I guess for lack of a better word, we're a little bit softer. And I don't mean like soft, like, <laughs> I don't mean careful. <laughs> um, yeah, <that's laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean soft like we soft, but it's like, I think our generation, our era is a lot different. You know, men of that generation have to face a lot more that we did, you know, going up. I'm 38 for those who don't know. I know it's great. And maybe a little uh, older, but I am 38. But um, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, there was a different time. So those men of that era, that generation, had to face a lot more. And so when you look at the different pictures from that era, you know, the men, they wore suits. You know, they were always dressed in the nines and dressed sharp because, um, I mean, it's like they had to represent. You know, because of the place that society had them in at that time. You know, so they were and still are a proud generation, a proud man. So, but um, getting back to affirmation, you know, first of all, I, I was, when my baby girl was born, she's not here right now, but it's like something, something sparked in me, you know, and we didn't know what she was going to be. We waited, and they said, it's a girl, and I just, I just felt something in my heart just, ah. And she, she's had me ever since. So, I mean, I was thankful to be a father. I've always loved kids. You know, um, my nieces and nephews can tell you that I've always been the jokey, playful uncle and, you know, hugging on them and everything. So, it, it was almost like God was doing that to prepare me to be the kind of father that I am to my children. Um, you know, I hug my children all the time. You know, I, I, I give them the discipline, I give them the instruction, but at the same time, our kids need that positive affirmation, you know, not just uh, just a touchy feely all the time, but it's like sometimes as fathers we get so caught up in the instructional part of fatherhood and what they should and shouldn't do, and we don't point out the things that they are good. At. You know, my, my son of mine, he's he's a big boy, but he has the kindest heart. You know, he's always trying to do something special for somebody, whether it's in our house, you know, whether it's for people here, whether it's for people at school. The boy actually got in trouble. In the, now, this tells you our society is, you know, he always wanted to bring something to his teachers, you know, and they got to a point where, because of the way society is now, and the teachers are so scared of the children, that they had to kind of make it a policy where the students can't bring 
apples of fruit or bananas to their teachers. And it's like, well, that was my son. I always want to do something for his teachers. You know, so those are the kind of things that you have to nurture, you know, in your children. That positive affirmation. Um, that that uh, Ahmad is just, he's like I said, he's a big boy for his age, but he's got the kindest, gentlest spirit, you know, and I, 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 I thank God for that. And I, I have to be careful because there's a fine line between, you know, I know the of this word, but I'm trying not to say it, perhaps, but I'm going to have to say it. There's a, there's a fine line between being kind and kind of being a punk, you know, and so, I'm, I'm, I'm staying there with my son, you know, to where it's okay to be kind. It's okay to be a, a, a loving, kind-hearted boy. And I want him to to remain that way, you know, for as long as he can. As he gets older, you know, I'm sure that his peers are going to, you know, count him a little bit about that. But that's, that's just, you know, those are the things that we have to look for as fathers. We don't always have to mold them into what we think you know, they should be. You know, we have to recognize the gift that God has yeah. put into them, yeah. the characteristics that God has placed into them. You know, my son's a big boy, so first thing everybody says, football, football, football. You know, I didn't make my son play football. He actually came to me and asked me about playing. You know, and it's, I mean, they've been saying that since he was a baby. Matter of fact, I think one of the midwives when they pulled him out, they were like, he's a linebacker. You know, because he was, he was 10 pounds, he was huge. And I called him a mini, mini hulk because he looked like he was already cut up already. You know how, how babies had those pieces and all that? I was like, look at my boy. You know what I mean? So it just, but people, <laughs> people, people, people put those things on your kids, you know, and you have to be careful. Amai plays football, he does pretty good with football. But I'm not that dad that was like, yeah, boy, um, I'm already picking up my house because you're going to get this scholarship and then you're going to be a uh, defensive end for the, you know, Kansas City Chiefs, that's my team. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't do that. You know, and I, I, I recognize, I thank God that he allows me to recognize the gift that he's put in him. Now, he has an ability to play football, but this last season, I don't know. He kind of wasn't there fully. So I even asked him at the end of this season. I said, son, you, you, you think you want to play football? He said, I'm not going to try baseball. He said, okay. We'll sign him up for baseball when the baseball tryouts are over. You know, I'm going to, I wasn't allowed to play sports, you know, when I was young. My parents just were like, you don't have insurance and you don't get hurt and you can play in the street. But as far as playing where I got hurt more in the street, ironically, <laughs> Concussions, uh, <laughs> several. Look, I had concussions before I knew what a concussion was. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, um, but I was never allowed to play organized sports, you know. So I said that I want to be a different dad. Wherever my kids' talents, you know, lie, I'm going to do my best to nurture that and you know give them that affirmation that they can do it if they choose to do it. So, um, um, yeah. So, the funny thing about Ahmad is that, yeah, he's a big boy, he's an athlete, young athlete, and he's looking to play other sports, but he loves to cook. He loves to always mix up some kind of concoction. You know, he's always trying to make smoothies, and not always the smoothie ingredients. <laughs> and he'll, he'll be in there, and my wife will be like, oh, here you go again. Making up something, you get that blender going, and I say he will just put whatever, honey, Coca-Cola, you know, uh, bananas, oh man, he'll, he'll mix it all up. And then he brings these two cups, you know, he's proud and he's proud, and he brings it to us, and I drink it. You know, I don't care how good or bad it tastes. I drink it and I say, thank you, son. My wife will take a sip and then when he leaves the room, that drink's mine. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to drink it. It's not going to kill me. You know, but it's like, and I tell her, I said, you know, we have to nurture that in him. Because the boy obviously likes to do things in the kitchen. You know, so he's going to be a chef slash 
from up there <laughs> slash minister. I don't know what he's going to be. You know, whatever God places, I'm going to continue to try to nurture that. So we, 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 we try to we try to put we try to put ourselves in position to not discourage him. You know, but to encourage his talents and maybe guide it. It's like, okay, son, you don't want to mix too many things. <laughs> And, and, and I don't I don't say because it doesn't taste good. I say because he's gonna break our blender, and then you know then I'm gonna. Play. So, <laughs> so but it, it's very important, you know, to to affirm those good things in our children. You know, I could go in there and be like, boy, what are you doing? You don't mix that together. And what is that gonna do? He's gonna stop, and he'll never touch the blender or anything in the kitchen. You know, so that's what that's what I think about when I think of affirmation in my my ch my family, my children. So um, I'm trying to look. I, I won't know what that's. Yeah. All right, to, I got some scriptures here. One is actually from Mark, but I think I'm not gonna read it. <laughs> look, I could. I got Mark. I got Colossians. Uh, you know, my thing a little bit. But um, um so. I'm going to read this one I wrote. Um, these are some things I looked up about uh, um, the importance of aff affirmation. Positive affirmations are a great way to help your child feel really good about themselves, to feel confident in their abilities and the person that they are. In general, regular use of positive affirmations will help your child to love themselves and life. So I mean, think Think of how it was when the children, you know, came to Jesus and, and the disciples were quick to, you know, discourage them. Like, you don't have to hear kids. And Jesus was like, no, you know, let the children come to me. It's like, that's how he sees us. So if we're always so quick to kick our kids out of the room, you know, when it's a, I mean, I understand there's a place for children and a place for adults. But sometimes we spend too much time like this and we need to be more like this, open arms to our children. You know, God was, um, he was, he was very generous to us, you know, with uh, giving us our three children. And I love him, you know, um, I'm the fun dad, I'm the, <clears throat> the crazy dad at times, I'm the loving dad, I'm the disciplinarian dad when I need to be, I'm the stern dad. But I try not to give them so much of what I got growing up, it's funny. I was sharing a story of the different items I had been whipped with one day. <laughs> and so apparently in my, you know, thought that it was um he took it upon himself to share it with other people. My dad was beat with a chain. <laughs> so hold on, son, I wasn't I wasn't beat with a chain. I was hit, you know, I happened to get hit with a chain, but it wasn't like I literally the chain replaced the belt. But I don't even know how we got into that, con that conversation. But it was like, I rarely, I can count on probably one hand the times that I've actually hit them with something other than my hand. You know, I was probably with every other day. You know, and it was like, all my sister, my younger sister, all she had to do was cry. No questions asked. I'm like, stop Because I knew I was going to get it. And she and she, the tears go, and then they get to making noise. Here comes my mom. No questions asked. It's just okay, going out and I'm getting whipped. You know, I've been whipped indoors, outdoors, in a garage, in a car. You know, you name it. In a store. I mean, oh, in the store, slaps was the worst because it was always a group of kids that was in the store that saw you get slapped. And no matter where you went to the store, here you go to the next aisle. You know, so I mean. I, <laughs> I'm not being funny, but it's like, that's not positive affirmation. It's not the face of the story. But um, at that time, it was necessary. That was what our parents didn't do. You know, but uh, 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 when you know better, you're supposed to do better. And, 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 and God has shown us all, you know, better. You know, he's shown us his grace. Um, the Old Testament was more whooping, chastising. You know, um, people was just struck down. You know, in the New Testament dispensation, there's grace, there's mercy, there's love. You know, so that's how we're supposed to be. 
with these precious gifts that God has given us. Sorry, Joe. Is there a time for chastisement? You best believe there. Yeah. But if you find yourself in more of a chastisement role, then um, role of affirmation and love may be a little time to do a little self-check. What are you so angry about when it comes to your children? What are you so impatient about when it comes to your children? These children that are a gift from God, that he has placed us over to raise up like things that Tim was saying. It's, it's, it's beautiful that um, these kids that spend a short time with you and your family come back, you know, and, and not only come back and see other people, I see them on the street sometimes too, but they continue to come back here. You know, so we know that the right, the right foundation was set in that household. And that is what we all in charge of doing. You know, setting the right foundation. You know, I, I was happy to see big old Leonard back there, Lord have mercy. But, uh, I, and I saw my hand and I looked, and I kind of rushed my hands like this. Because I'm used to little glasses wearing Leonard. And they come Leonard, no glasses. Mention about 225. I'm just guessing. Probably right there, like probably 250. But uh, but I mean Leonard. But he, he, despite what Leonard has gone through in his life, you know, where is he this morning? Yeah. And on all days to hear a powerful testimony and to hear part two of. Father's the Father's Day message. You know, it's not by accident that you hear it. You know, and, and, and God orders all our steps. You know, so you keep coming. You keep coming. You, know, you have to get here by yourself. If you need a ride, one of us will get you. You know, and I'm not just standing here saying that. I mean, you know where we live. I make sure you have our number before we leave. But that's the kind of things that we have to do. You know, for our generation, because they're faced with so much. I don't know if any of you got a chance to see that video um, with the, uh, the the elderly woman on the bus. Poor oh, mercy. You know, I posted that on Facebook. It was hard for me to watch that. It was ten minutes of just absolute hell for that woman. She's sixty-eight years old, and she's on a bus full of middle school children, and they're just berating her in every way possible. Her tears didn't even move them. And they wouldn't stop. So it's like that's that's what our that's what our generation is producing. You know, if we're not careful and not do the things that God tells us to do, those kids probably weren't positively affirmed. They were probably berated just like they berated that lady. So, um, so I mean, that's I'm kind of stuck on that. One. But um, yeah, make sure that we take good care of what God has placed us over Amen. our children. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can say I have to a rock to too. But I remember when I was, as I was raising Josh earlier in his life, he was, I was an impatient father because I didn't understand how this turkey can just, I say one thing and he does exactly the opposite. He was just, it was like the backwards child. Like, it frustrated me and I would whoop him and tell him, you know, whoop him. And I found one day that I realized I was whooping him more than affirming and loving him. And the Lord began to speak at me and said, man, now I'm not saying Josh don't deserve it, but what have you done to me even recently, that doesn't deserve the same chest title that you just gave your son. How are you going to stand in front of me as you discipline this child over and over and get angry and get frustrated and get upset? How are you going to discipline him like that? And I wasn't heavy handed on you. When you needed my grace, when you needed me to look the other way, when you needed me to affirm you or catch you just to get you to pray one more day. How are you going to be this father and I'm doing this for you? And it woke me up, Shante. Even as Josh now, his whoopings have curved. I ain't saying he's going to get whoopings still. But his whoopings have curved because I'm realizing my father and how I raise my children should be a direct reflection of how my father raises me. And I have to give great. I have to extend love. I have to affirm. I have to make sure he knows that I love him and I got his back more. Then I'm on and frustrated about him and angry with him and uptight. Come on, John, you still sit down, man. Come on, preach. John said, I told him they got a minimum of five minutes. John said, I'm going to be 2.5 for the opportunity to become a father. God, give me a big 
gift of a child that I have charge over and, and have the responsibility of raising him up, not only to be a good child and do well in school, but to fear God. Yeah. And, and I thank God for the opportunity. But to start from the ground of the foundation, um, rebelliousness. I'm a heavy, I'm a, I'm a stickler on children being bad. I, I just, and in my opinion, there's nothing worse than, than some, a kid just acting up. And, and I've been that way. And I guess it was because of the way I was brought up. I was a 15-year-old kid drums doing service, getting called out and beat with a drum stick. And I remember I had the nerve to tell my mom, I'm telling my teacher. <laughs> my dad told him we got home, he's gonna tell the teacher. I said, he said, okay, um, you better tell him to bring the cops because they're gonna need me to stop me from what we're going on. And, and that's the kind of, I mean, it was like, you're either you gonna live under my roof and obey up for by my my rules, or you're gonna have to find someone else to say. Amen. And that's Amen. that's the tough love that, that this generation has gotten completely away from. Oh, like, man. Kids these days, like you're saying, talk crazy to the bus drivers, fighting with the teachers, fighting with your teacher. Man. Back in my day, my teacher would have snatched me up, <laughs> drug me to the office, and then I would have got beat by my dad. Yeah. But um. You know, I thank God for, for just giving me patience. I'm, I'm a soft, everyone who knows me knows I have a really, really soft heart. And my little girl's always, and I could even be a little more, you know, playful. You know, she likes to play. And, and I remember my, my pastor, my brother telling me, one time she's a little, little girl. And I was a new father, I didn't, but she was doing something kind of just repetitious. And, you know, kids, I just keep on doing the same thing over and over. And I was like, Come on, man, stop. You know, stop doing it. And my brother said, you know, you don't want to get on it too much. You, you don't want to break her little spirit. And you don't. You don't want to break her spirit if she's singing. Let her let the girl sing. She can, she'll do all that all night long. And we had the nerve to buy her a gift the other day. It's like an amplifier. So she's in her room. <laughs> we asked for it. But you want to, like, like Rob said, you want to encourage them. If, she, if, they, if they show a liking to it, you want to do it. But on the rebellious side, the Bible describes a rebellion as witchcraft or divination. And y'all, it starts young. I don't, I don't believe, and I might be wrong, I don't believe that I've ever had, um, that I've ever, I, I don't believe that my little girl has ever thrown a fit and ran away from me. Thrown a fit. Though, though, that kind of stuff will not happen. Not, not, with, not in my house. And my wife keeps telling me, babe, all right. When the little one, the, when the you know the, the new one comes, you probably be a little softer, so you let him get away. No, I've established in my mind that God is calling for us. We're setting ourselves up for failure. We're doing a disservice for our children when we let them do it. You know, Amen. we're not going to beat them all day long, Amen. but they, they cannot. They can't challenge us. That's right. we're, we're the adults, and we're the we're the figures that that they have to look up to. They can, they have to know there has to be order. Yes. There has to be order, and there's nothing that God respects more than order. Uh, the, the Bible says that uh, uh, obedience is greater than sacrifice. Yeah. If we establish in those kids and their minds first, I'm, I'm your I'm your number one authority in this house. And I have to answer to God. If I, if I allow you to do whatever you feel like you're big enough to do now, when you're 15, 16 years old, you're going to be trying to fight me. And that's not going to happen either. You're going to be trying to go to school and fight somebody. And that's not going to happen. So we're going to establish right now, you're not going to be doing no fighting. Nobody. And, and you will obey the rules. You will not rebel. And my, my number one example, my mom and dad didn't give me, didn't give me a choice whether I was going to church or not. That, that wasn't a choice. They didn't give me a choice whether I was going to play the drums or not. That wasn't a choice. And but that, those are small things. But it starts. It starts to let you know you you aren't in charge until you until you separated yourself from me. And then Bill Court is cut. You're grown grown up. You, you can do whatever you want to do. You're in God's control then. But until you're out of my house, I have to answer for you, and I have to answer for. 
basically for your soul until you're old enough to, to do uh, uh, or to, to understand what it is that God requires of us, I'm responsible for you. That's right. So rebelliousness, um, I say start young. It's never too young to be harsh. You just when they act up, let them know. That's un, that's unacceptable. That that behavior. In law enforcement, they tell us work on your command presence. When I make a stop, I make contact with someone. I don't say, how you doing, sir? You doing all right? No, no. That's not how I speak to somebody. I let them know. You're, you're being stopped legally. I'm in control right now. I need to talk to you about the infraction that you committed. Simple as that. That's how our children need to know. You are being detained right now. I need to talk to you, and we need to establish what your punishment is. So, um, you know, I thank God. I thank God for... For giving me a child who's she's such a she don't she don't play. If I look at her and I I, I appreciate that, and that's what I want. I want my little girl to understand that is that is number that is number one. If he's unhappy with me because of something I did, I need to fix it. Yeah. Because it's out of line with what he requires of me, what he expects of me. Same thing with God. That, he's number one. Yeah. If we step out of line, we know when, when, when we're doing wrong. Yeah. And it's not, it doesn't have to be something like, you know, stealing $100 from your, from your work. And I hope ain't nobody stealing $100. Yeah. But it does have to be something like that. It could be, God God has told me for a while now, I should probably be getting up at about, you know, 7 o'clock and giving him an hour of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Over and over. Before you know it, we start, to, we start to feel like, okay, whatever I got coming, I deserve it. You know, I, and it hits us like, okay, I can't do that, but thank God that he kept his word. He's he not a liar. You know, do what you're supposed to do. And everything will, everything's not going to be smooth and roses. But when you when you live in rebellion, rebellion, everything will not be great. I can assure you that. When you live, in, when you live with God, when you live according to an alignment to what he requires of you, things will be acceptable and in order. And like, like the word says, uh, Obedience is better than sacrifice. So I thank God, like I said, the, the opportunity to become a father. Um, it's, it's challenging at times. I I spend a lot of time not doing what I want to do. I like to fish. I love to fish. If I could be fishing right now, if we didn't have church, I'd go to the somewhere in the deep with some water fishing. Um, but I, I found myself Having to, like Rock said, you want to, you want to, you want to affirm your kids, and 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 you don't have to do what you want to do all the time. Rock will drink the nastiest drink ever made because his little boy wanted to make him a drink. So I reward her. I, I, I do. That's what you have to do it a, a lot of as well. Reward them when they're when they're on the right track, when they're doing good stuff. Reward them. It doesn't have to be. You know, a two hundred and fifty dollar toy or something. Reward and take it. You know what? You were good today. I noticed that you were really good. We're gonna go get your toy now. It's as simple as that. And everybody, it, it doesn't like I said, it doesn't have to be a big, a big dollar amount. Take it to nine nine cents or take it tonight. Get, get, go pick out two or three toys. That makes a child's day and it establishes in them. I've been good. My parents noticed it. There's a reward for for good behavior. There's a. a it's not about giving the kids something all the time. It's about establishing. If I if I do what I'm supposed to do, I will be rewarded. Just like what we have with, with, with God. If we do what we're supposed to do, He will reward us. Um, if we seek Him, He's going to reward us. We praise Him, He will reward us. We pay our tithes, we'll be rewarded. You know, it's just a, it's just how God's order is. And I thank God for that. But rebelliousness, y'all, dip it in the bud. Don't let it go. Don't. It's not cute. I'm telling you right now, it's not cute. Um, I deal with the people who act up all day. I deal with people who are, you know, all messed up because their 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 parents let them run them up all through, you know, through the house and beat up everybody and you know, stabbing their siblings. I deal with those people, y'all, and I'm telling you, if you allow it, you are setting your children up for failure. And God will not be pleased with that because whose blood is going to be on, on, whose hands is the blood going to be on? I gave you charge over that child and you let them do whatever, you, whatever they felt like they were big enough to do. Don't allow it, y'all. Get in the blood. 
that no love. Don't beat him. Don't go to jail because you beat the sheriff. <laughs> don't do it. But nip it in the bud and, and be be uh, the the man or the woman, uh, the man in this case that God would, would want us to be. That He's shown us. He's done it you know, lovingly. He's been stern and harsh at times and let us know I could have tipped you out. I'm giving you another opportunity. Do it with love. I thank God for my time. I thank God for you all, fathers. Let's be strong together. Let's, let's change the cycle that we've had the past 15, 20 years. The kids these days, I'm telling you, they are the absolute worst. They're the worst, the worst, the worst. It's our responsibility to try to change it and get things back on the track. The, that generation there was probably the greatest as far as, as far as respect. Those kids would not talk back to even a stranger. And that's how it should be. Y'all, our kids should not be talking crazy to anybody who walks by our house. Hey, hey, don't you be looking at my palm tree. Come on, man. Wanting to fight somebody or looking at your dog or your cat or, you know, kill Trying to shoot you over killing the, the dog that's trying to bite him. Y'all, that's ridiculous. That's rebellion. For, I mean, that's the definition of rebellion. Rebellion. Just being for no reason. Uh, but I think, I thank God for, uh, like I said, the opportunity. And, uh, Let's be strong together, y'all. Let's raise up some, some men and women that will fear and respect God. If they fear God, y'all, you don't have to. I, I stay out of a lot of trouble because I was afraid of what God would do to me if I got into the wrong, wrong foolishness. So, you know, let's raise them up in the way they should go, and they, they will not be part.